But we'll start today with Hilde Katz. Hilde is a longtime resident of Sonoma County. I know she went to school at Sonoma State, but I think she'll give you a brief uh, biography. Uh, Hank is rather new to Sonoma County, but he has done a lot of work with us and also with um, the Listening Project, um, which is a nonprofit organization that um, spends time in, in classrooms teaching children how to take oral histories and listen to people's stories. And then we have Alfred Batstorff, although I am given to calling him Al, who is, um, if I'm not mistaken, was the oldest person to be on the kinder transports. And I don't know. You don't know, but... but if you know it, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of the first. He was one of the first. And it was quite an exciting reason to, uh, looking back on it now, all right, uh, to be chosen to be sent over to England. Um, Al has lived in Sonoma County for quite a while. He's a retired mechanical engineer. I might mention that Hank is a retired social worker. And... Um, Enough of me, they have some very interesting things to tell you, and uh, we're looking forward to it. So, why don't you welcome Hilde Katz. When necessary, Daniel, I'll turn it Yes, I just, um, good afternoon. I always welcome the opportunity to be at the conference in the state. As um, Dr. Goodman said, I was a student here, but that was about a hundred years ago, when there were only two buildings, Stevenson and Darwin, not a sprig of greenery anywhere, and it was called Sonoma State College. But I had a very good experience and a very good education. Um, um, anyway, it's nice to be back. Yes, I was one of the kinder transport children, or kinder. You kind of mentioned kinder, and I realized that we are called kinder, meaning children, even at this, this late stage in our lives. <laughs> I find that somewhat amusing. About myself, I grew up in a very small town of about 40,000 in Germany, near Frankfurt. We were just in the northern part of Bavaria. We were about 40,000 population, of which were about 400, 500 Jewish families. My earliest experience of knowing of being taught that was different occurred in a country setting when I was playing with some kids in a meadow and it was supposed to be posing as clocks and this is a quarter, this is a half, half an hour and I was not very adept at it and suddenly someone yelled, you stupid cow, no wonder you're a Jew clock. And I was wondering why they trashed my religion instead of my awkwardness. Anyway, I would have called this latent anti-Semitism, which was always a very uh, important German uh, life. When the Nazis came to power, anti-Semitism was the cornerstone of their politics. The motto was, Jews are our misfortune. How did this overt this was overt anti-Semitism. How did this manifest itself? Signs appeared over stores saying Jews were not welcome here. Restaurants in stores, we were kept waiting. Our former schoolmates no longer invited us. We were called Jew pig. We were beaten up in school. So the Jewish community established a Jewish school to provide us a safe environment. I'll give you one other experience that occurred to me when I was about 11. My parents sent me and my older sister to the local theater to attend our first opera. We were very excited in all the dresses and marched there into the, th into the theater, had nice seats and enjoyed what we were seeing. And just before the first act, we were tapped on our shoulder and told to leave. Why, I asked. A Nazi functionary in the audience objected to having to share the theater with Jews. I remember I was so angry I went to the box office to try and get our money back, but my sister pulled me back and said, don't make trouble. 
I wondered who was making trouble. Uh, Crystal Night, I'm sure you all know what occurred in Kristallnacht and Crystal Night, exacerbated our humiliation and victimization. It was state-sponsored violence so that individual violence became acceptable. We were excluded from the right of citizenship. We were stateless and not protected under the law, under the laws of the country. Um, Jews were no longer allowed to own businesses. We were not allowed to use libraries or other public services. Still had to pay taxes though. We were not allowed to uh, retain valuable objects. And I remember my mother going with a pillow slip of uh, some silverware we have and some objects, some uh, like a silver cups and so on, and also some jewelry and had to take it to some sort of agency. Right around that Christmas night, I, a friend of ours told me only recently that his father had uh, parent appendicitis. No hospital would accept him. So the physician finally came home and performed the procedure in the home. Hard to understand, but this is, these are the sort of things that took place. Seven, uh, Months after Kristalna, at the age of 14, my parents readied me for the kinder transport. They packed a trunk, but before we could close it, a guard had to come to our house and observe what we were packing to make sure we were not taking anything out of the country that was of any value. I don't know, have you seen the film Kinder Transport? Or some of it? Yes. yes. Okay, if you have some the students who've seen it, as in the film, my parents took me to the train station and to say goodbye. Um, they admonished me to be in my good behavior. I was going to some foster parents, so-called foster parents, and um, I would be polite, courteous, would study hard, and again, it was at my good best behavior. My father placed his hands on my head and recited the Hebrew play, prayer of the farewell. My mother nervously adjusted my collar, um, stroked me and said, little one, don't worry, we will, be because we will be together again soon. I would never ever see my parents again. Once we were on the train, we youngsters in the compartment took out the goodies our parents had packed and um, were in a submissive, sort of subdued mood. Um, as the train came to the frontier, a Nazi guard entered and we were absolutely petrified. He had you know, black boots and he had a gun and he asked us to open some of our suitcases and looked through, poked around and then left. We let out a sigh of relief. As we crossed the Dutch border, after we crossed the Dutch border, pandemonium broke loose. We were laughing, jumping on seats, on the seats, and we're just expressing, letting off steam, expressing our happiness. Um, as you probably know, that um, at the first station in Holland, Dutch women came to every kinder transport train. They approached our train came to our window, handed us candies, toys, and some stoked our cheeks. And I know we were all nonplussed. Who these strange people were and why were they so nice to us? The train continued. We got to the Dutch, um, we got to the um, North Sea. We boarded a boat to take us to England. And all I remember of that is being set enormously seasick all night and wished nothing more than to be at home under my nice cozy feather bed. Uh, the next morning the train took off and went to Liverpool Street Station in London. There we were children with uh, our name tags and numbers, uh, tired, not knowing what to expect, and um, the adults running around giving instructions in a language we could not understand. 
eventually I was put on a train to Coventry, which I'm not quite sure, I think it's about 100 miles north of London, where I would meet my new family. I know the train I sat, I uh, thought about or fantasized, would my new parents be lords and ladies? Would they play croquet on the lawn? Would they, um, would I be served watercress sandwiches by a beautiful maid? When I arrived, Mrs. Beckett stood on the platform in a, a flowered dress, a hat and very sensible shoes to welcome her new, grand, new foster daughter. She took me to their home. The Beckett's were a very simple working class family. We lived on the premises of a hospital where Mr. Beckett was the um, ambulance driver. Um, they were very nice to me. Um, I met the, one of their children, an 18 year old son, Jim, who was fascinated with, was fascinated with this young little refugee girl who could barely speak one coherent English sentence, as I was with a six foot of manhood, having grown up in a family with only the girls. Um, the fourth member was Peter, aged five, and I quickly realized that one of the reasons that the Beckett had sponsored me was to take care of Peter and also be the household help. I miss school. I was not allowed to go to school. I miss school. I miss contact with other Jewish children. But I also looked at this as a new adventure, as I have often in my life, when, when I face subsequent challenges. Three months after the war, and three months after I arrived, the war was declared, declared that the atmosphere changed. Um, I was no longer a little Jewish uh, refugee, but I was an enemy alien. Jim joined the army, and when uh, letters came from his home, they tore off his address, so I would not see it. And I'm not sure whether they thought about it. I might be a 15-year-old spy. Anyway, I stayed with the Beckett's for one year, and then the Jewish committee placed me in a home in London to be trained as a children's nurse. I was just uh, arriving at the time of what was called the London Blitz, which were the air raid attacks during the day and then at night time. We were in an industrial area, in the institution, if, um, it was evacuated to about 60 miles out of London. And we were afraid that perhaps the institution would have had a direct hit. Um, I, however, this new setup um, was makeshift and it no longer had the accreditation. So I realized I could be working there all my life and never get a diploma. One day I was leaving, leaving through a trade magazine and saw that uh, and had someone advertising for trainees for children's nurses in the west of England, no tuition required. That's what I jumped to because I had no money to pay tuition. Anyway, I applied, I was accepted, and I set off to this beautiful, beautiful town of Cheltenham in the west of London. Well, if something is going to be true, it really wasn't. <laughs> it was a Dickinsonian institution run by two ladies who were pretty harsh. Um, I guess you could call not user friendly. Uh, they worked us very hard, but also we learned something. Other, there was one other training. Uh, but we made the best of it. After all, it was wartime. Uh, at that time, I was always hungry because we were, were Russian. And I, I remember getting half an egg every two weeks. That was a highlight. Um, and because I was hungry, I pawned some of my clothes. And I relished in, in this buying of fish and chips in the <coughs> newspapers, which was the English way. But so what? As I said, it was wartime. Anyway, these were no hardships when compared to my parents back in Germany. We were able to communicate via, via Red Cross letters 25 words every month. They admonished me to learn and to study. Much later, I learned of the deprivations that my parents had to endure. For instance, Jews could no longer own phones, pets, 
bicycles, typewriters. They had to relinquish warm clothing for soldiers at the front. Um, they were only eligible for half a ration card and could only go to the stores at four o'clock after most of the shelves had been cleared cleaned, and there were no supermarkets that were restocked every night. Um, they even lived, uh, my parents had to take in another Jewish family and then were sent to a Jew house. These were houses all over Germany where Jews were herded awaiting transport, awaiting transport. They received a notification to appear at a train station uh, one early morning at 5 a.m. But the day before they left, a German women came to the Jew house and put stickers on pieces of furniture and other items that they would claim the following day. Um, I had an eyewitness, a long friend, childhood friend of mine, who hid herself behind a wooden barricade, who told me this. 134 Jews boarded a box train that would take them to the larger city, about um, 45 minutes away. There, they waited two days until Jews from other surrounding areas could also assemble. And um, they had to sleep on bare floors in a beer garden restaurant. In the evening, the um, uh, Nazi functionaries held a party in a raffle and raffled off the belongings that these um, Jews brought with them. Um, yes, they were told by the, to be resettled to the East. And my father really seemed to have believed it, thank goodness, because he took along packages of seeds. Actually, this was a euphemism for killing centers. Uh, when finally uh, transport was assembled, um, the group marched in broad daylight through the city in full view of the uh, population. Uh, some years ago, through someone, I came across some photos, the only photos taken by the Gestapo of transports. One of those transports my parents were on, but I could not identify them any of the photos that were sent to me. But I will show some to you, so you get a feeling of the atmosphere that exists. watching so that all proceeds according to law. One of them above that says, uh, below that, the most beautiful of the chosen people. In other words, nothing but sarcastic remarks. You see people were, were allowed one suitcase, and you notice most of them are carrying shoulder bags in white. Why in white, I don't know. But in other words, they carried along with them as much as they could possibly carry hoping to be resettled to the east. But what this says, Sarah now has to do her own carrying up here. Yes, we were given names um, of 
strive for men, Sarah, for women, to identify us in our official papers as being Jews. That's what this means. Then it says, um, look at the trash. Look at the trash of our people. So not only was the harassment, was the harassment going on, but also you could imagine the atmosphere that was created there. My parents stayed, it took a long time, but uh, research over the, uh, many years, I finally was able to get some information that indeed that transport took about three days to reach its destination, which was Eastern Poland. At that time, those transportees had to leave the train and walk by three possibilities, walk by foot about uh, three or four kilometer, kilometers were immediately shot and buried in mass graves. Or they were sent to uh, Belzec, which was a, the most primitive of killing centers because it used carbon monoxide. Or they were sent to Sobibor, which was also a killing center. No records are available. Now, recently, the German um, uh, Research Institute has opened up new records, thousands of them, and I just recently wrote to them and asked them if they could please search if there's some additional information is available. That is as far as I was able to get. I want to just talk about another subject. You've probably been aware that over the years Germany has faced its sordid past. And in many ways among them, among them was making restitutions and seeking reconciliation with its former Jewish citizens. In 1978, 40 years after the Crystal Night, cities began inviting its Jewish residents. When I received the invitation, I was very uh, hesitant to go. It was a difficult decision, but I accepted. However, I stated that I want my visit to have some purpose, that I would like to have a dialogue with some young people. Indeed, the city gladly made arrangements for this meeting. Imagine my surprise when the room filled up with 17 to 75 year olds. The younger ones were eager to hear our stories and possibly wanted to see what Jews looked like, because the city had been devoid of Jews since these people were transported out. The older ones remembered other families. There were emotions on both sides. The visitors recalling painful memories, the townspeople expressing sympathy, remorse, and the young ones' consternation. Some really tearfully expressed their feelings of guilt, and there was a lot of sobbing going on. For me, I experienced the gamut of emotions. Anxiety at recalling the memories of the past, but also a joyful rediscovery of my former life as a young, carefree child, wondering how to re reconcile the two at times I felt guilty. The weeks where young people bore fruit, since the city with its 30s, which in the 30s had 400 um, Jewish families, and was then, then and still is, as I said, devoid of Jews, Several British city residents formed an organization promoting awareness of Jewish history, Jewish culture, and Jewish life. Over the years, they've established a small Jewish museum, which is regularly visited by school. The city planted a memorial grove on the empty space where the synagogue was turned onto the ground. A large plaque installed clearly states the dates on which these 134 Jewish residents of the city were sent to their deaths. Yearly on the anniversary of the Crystal Night, several organizations hold a memorial service outside this museum and then silently march with lighted candles, setting one in front of houses where Jewish residents once lived. 
I returned to my hometown in subsequent, in subsequent city invi uh, sponsored invitations. The most recent last summer. This time the city invited us to a reunion of students of the former Jewish school. We were white haired folks coming from Argentina, Peru, England, and the United States. Some of us had not seen each other for over six or sixty seven years, and yet we immediately felt connected. Many had changed their names, but we called each other by their original names. The city had prepared a remarkably varied program for us. It began with a formal reception in the ornate city hall, where we were officially welcomed in the presence of the mayor and his 22 council members, who were taken to the Jewish cemetery, where a grid had been prepared so we could easily find our ancestors' graves. We were astonished to find the city had prepared a database of our families and printed and presented us each individually with gene genealogies. It was a festive banquet at City Hall, castle, the city castle, which by the way is absolutely beautiful, where we sat under crystal chandeliers and found calligraphy calib <laughs> and place cards in front of our golden plates. During the dinner, the mayor turned to me. By the way, a mayor in Germany has more political clout than a legislator does in the state the capital here. He said, tell me about your experience on the Kindertransport. When he rose to give his speech, he said the following. I'm a father of, four, of three children. I cannot imagine what it must have been like for the parents of our visitors to send their children to a strange country, strange people in a strange language. I looked up at him and found tears on his cheeks. This is the first time that I've ever heard anyone in Germany being able to personalize these sort of experiences. I was happy that I'd taken our daughter and granddaughter along so they could experience the connection that, was, um, that our town people felt toward us. On the last day of our stay, I was asked to speak to a class of high school students. They are now the third, almost the fourth generation removed from the Nazi era. I knew from the previous experiences that they could not understand how Germany in the 30s could so easily acquiesce to such a brutal regime. I was prepared and brought along the brought along following. Do I have a few more minutes for some transparencies? I think it takes, I do it simpler, I, I do it here. And it, what I showed them is, for instance, the children's book that we all grew up with. And it's it still in the household. Here it's called the Frowsy Peter. Looks like a nice little hippie guy. Uh, anyway, each story had something to do. One is, um, the mother admonishes little Pauline not to touch the um, matches while she's out, because she would burn to death. And what happened? She touched the matches, and she burned to death. The next one was a little Conrad, I think. Um, a rather hardy fellow who refused to eat his soup. His mother said, um, I will give you nothing else. The second day he refused, the third day he refused, the fourth day he was even thinner, and on the fifth day he died. Um, the other one, is my favorite one, is um, Mama goes out and says to her little boy, do not suck your thumb, because if you do, the tailor will come and cut them off. What happened? He sucks his thumb, he's, uh, they're cut off. I ask these students, what does this teach children? May you come to a quicker <laughs> recognition of it than they did. What I told them it did, it showed what happened to children who do not obey. Obedience was a very high value in German society. So if you obey your parents, you obey your teacher, you obey your state. Just go to one more thing.
regarding obedience, and so on, I would just like to end with <coughs> comments that uh, Edmund Burke, a uh, um, 18th century philosopher, stated, all that is necessary for evil to succeed is for good people to remain silent. But just let me go back to the to one more time to the Becker family. I'm eternally grateful to this family who was willing to take in a Jewish child and thereby save my life. And I've had a splendid life. And I wish the same to all of you. Thank you. schools. My family had been in the city for several generations and was quite well established, well known, and uh, lived a pretty comfortable life until the Nazis came in and in 1935 the new laws took effect. My father was thrown out of his business and uh, lost some of his uh, of the house. And, uh, but we remained in school and uh, got along as best we could. By 1938, quite a few of the Jewish families had left the community. They had emigrated to other countries. My father was not in a position to leave because he had been injured during World War II where he served in the German army, as did uh, several, I'm sorry? World War I. World War I. <laughs> no, I have trouble with that. <laughs> as did several uncles and other relatives. In fact, one of my uncles was uh, killed while serving in the German army in Galicia. In uh, Crystal Night, Crystal Night in November 1938, I had a very different feel to it. Roughly three o'clock in the morning, there was a tremendous noise at our front door, and several Gestapo agents came to take my father away to a concentration camp. Later that morning, we found out that the synagogue was on fire. And uh, a little bit later in the day, they started pounding on our door again. At that time, they took my mother, my eight-year-old brother, I was ten at the time, took the three of us, and uh, made us go out in the street where we were met by the remaining Jewish women and kids. All the men had been hauled off to the concentration camp in the middle of the night. And they walked us down the street to the police station, where at the age of 10 and a half, I spent my first night in jail. On 
the way to the city jail, the street was lined by the local population who had been ordered out to jeer and make commotion and noises. A very scary feeling. It was interesting that when I was back in Germany last October, I met a classmate of mine, German, and, uh, by now retired as a professor of forestry in the local schools, who remembered that scene on the street, because he and his mother had been ordered out to jeer and take noises. And he says, I asked my mother, why are they taking Hans to jail? And she said to me, not everyone in jail is a bad person. Now this is something that Frederick remembered, Friedrich remembered, like, uh, what, 60 years later? I thought it was kind of a telling comment. In, uh, at the same time, mid-November of that year, they threw us out of school, and there were six or eight Jewish kids left in the city. So they set up a classroom for us at what was left of the synagogue on that site. But at that time, my parents made the decision that my brother and I needed to leave the country. They could not because my father was walking with a cane. He had been injured, and getting a visa to any other country was quite difficult. They arranged to have us go to a children's home in France. And they had set up several children's homes to receive German Jewish refugees who came over. We took the train to Berlin with them. It was about an eight-hour trip. And the next day, we met up with other kids who had also had the destination of Paris. And they said goodbye to us at the railroad station. We went to France. They went back to Stralsund, to our hometown, where they remained for about another week. Just enough time for the Nazis to pick up my father once again, throw him into jail, and convince him that he needed to sell the building at the business which had been leased to somebody else, uh, which of course he did. They confiscated the money, and my parents moved to one of the other communities where my father was employed as a caseworker for one of the Jewish relief agencies. <coughs> we came to France, came to the children's home. It was a rough kind of a trip because here was a bunch of kids who didn't know each other. We knew we were going to a strange country, didn't know the language. We knew that we were going to a children's home, but what was a children's home? What do you know about children's homes at age 10? And uh, we were met by people who fortunately spoke our language because many of the staff in these children's homes were also refugees. And the other bit was that they were, for the most part, professionals who had teachers and others who had worked with children. So there was competent staff to help us to make an adjustment quickly. They very quickly threw us into the French school system so that we were immersed in the French language. And uh, it wasn't too uncomfortable. For the first six months there, we had regular correspondence with our parents. But on September 1st, 1939, we had left Germany in the middle of March 1939. September 1st, Germany invaded Poland. France and England declared war, and from that night on, the air raid sirens sounded every night just to test it. And we had for the shelter, they issued us gas masks in schools, long metal canisters, bigger than we were for the most part, that we walked off to school with gas masks and felt quite important because of it, I think. That, of course, marked the time in which we lost all contact with our parents because once the war had started, it was impossible to correspond with them. Uh, we remained in this children's home near Paris until May of 1941. That's the time when Germany broke loose and overran the northern side of France and occupied a good part of it. 
we were, together with the other kids in these children's homes, evacuated some, to some very quickly set up homes in old castles in the central part of France, which housed us and uh, had no furnitures, didn't have any bathrooms, they weren't set up to house kids. But they did the job, and the older boys in the group, old about that, that time, meant they were 13 and 14, I was 11. Spain who relayed messages for us. So when God, oh, this is France, which was famous for its friends. Have we remained there and uh, we had occasional contact with our parents through a friend in Spain who relayed messages for us. Uh, then, as time went on, in May 1941, Germans were pressing further, but they were still staying out of the un 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 unoccupied areas. And arrangements were made to take, in the course of the summer of 1941, 200 kids from these children's homes and to take them to the United States. Between 1934 and 1945, about 1,000 so-called unaccompanied minors were taken to the United States and admitted. That was a relatively small group when you think about it. The United States was not particularly hospitable to refugees, particularly to Jewish refugees. And uh, it took a fair amount of work, particularly on the part of Ellen Roosevelt, to get the OKs to move a small group of kids at that particular time out of France and to the States. We were told one day, pack up, you're going to America. Once again, we didn't know why, we didn't know how we were picked, we didn't know what was happening to us. They moved us to a assembly center in an old church in Marseille, France, on the Mediterranean, where the operation was run by the American Friends Service Committee, the Quakers. They had arranged to move these kids from France through Spain into Portugal 
and then had chartered a ship that brought us to the United States. Uh, we arrived mid-June 1941, once again. Didn't speak any English, didn't know anybody, didn't know what was happening to us. The plan at that time was to park us, and I mean that it was kind of, you know, put us someplace, to park us in a foster home in Philadelphia on a temporary basis while they figured out what to do with us. The, uh, I was 13 at the time, my brother was 11, and we spent the summer in Philadelphia going to the YMHA to learn English on a daily basis. When it came time to start school in September, I got enrolled in public school, and here I was, 13, fairly good size, wound up in third grade because they wanted to teach me English. You know, it was awfully hard to squeeze into those little chairs. I remember that. <laughs> Which was a great motivator to learn English quickly. <laughs> Worked. A couple months of that, and we got the word that my brother and I were destined to join family in Baltimore, who was going to take us in and raise us for as long as needed. While this was underway, a very distant relative of mine who lived in Minneapolis at that time, who had come to the United States in the early 1930s and was quite well established, saw a story in one of the Jewish newspapers that listed our names and our hometowns and noted that we had arrived in the States in June of that year. They got a hold of one of the social service agencies and claimed us. So we were told, okay, Baltimore's off, you're going to Minneapolis. Now, no, knowing now what I know now, I would have preferred Baltimore. <laughs> because getting to Minneapolis in October, November <laughs> gets a little bit cold. And I was immediately introduced to the city by becoming, taking on a newspaper route. Early morning around Lake Lyle <coughs> Boulevard, snow crunching noisily as it was twin below and there are the pending things. Interesting times. I uh, enrolled in school very quickly and uh, learned English very fast, <coughs> although with an accent. From Minneapolis, the family moved to Cedar Rapids, Iowa, rather quickly because my uncle cousin or whatever, a distant relative who was an engineer changed jobs. So here I found myself in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, which was, you know, rather small, semi-agricultural manufacturing community. Out of it, totally, you know, what is happening to me? Again, back into the school system, and uh, I finished high school there. And during this time, we, of course, had no word from our parents. We didn't know whether they were dead, alive, or whatever. I spent much of this time being very, very busy because I didn't want time to think. I think my adolescent years were marked by class, study hard, and get a job and spend your time there. Fill your time so that there was not. I was busy with extracurricular activities. I had a part time job. I was in school. The minute I turned 18 and graduated <coughs> high school, I said to the draft board, I want to volunteer. The Army needs me. Different days. And they said, You are an enemy alien. We can't take you. <laughs> But they investigated me and said that I was a good MBA alien and I, <laughs> I was inducted into the United States Army in uh, summer of 46. And I was sure that I would be able to get to Germany so I would be able to track down my parents. Mound up in Japan doing occupation duty. And uh, shortly after that, I <clears throat> I was demobilized 
came back to the States, started college. And the minute I finished college, by that time I was no longer an alien, but I was a citizen. A week before I graduated, got my orders to come back from the Army. This was in 51 at the height of the Korean War. And I spent a couple of years back in the service, got out, and uh, went on to graduate school, got my social work degree. Went to work, raised a family, and then I retired. It does happen. It was interesting that from Cedar Rapids, <clears throat> I, my undergraduate work was done in Iowa City, the University of Iowa, but after that the Army stationed me in Denver, which was while it was cold, it was very nice and pleasant. I decided that graduate school would have to be spent in different climates, so I came out here to go to SC. I think, you know, it was a, an interesting journey over the years. And I didn't go back to Germany until May of, 9th of 2005. I didn't trust myself. I didn't know whether I wanted to go. And at that particular point, I went alone just to see if I could handle the feeling to it. It was a pretty emotional trip. But I came back and uh, decided that I'd go back over with my children to show them what had happened. And uh, if you'll start the pictures, slides. I went back with the intent of placing memorial tablets <coughs> for my family, could move down a bit. More. Okay, let's start right here. This is what that old city looked like. A marked place and uh, an old cathedral dating back to uh, 1350 or thereabouts. St. Nicholas Church. All right, go on. next to it on the right, a tall building with the funny gables is the city hall. Next to it is what is the old police station. That's where I spent my time in jail. Still standing, but no longer police station. But you remember these things when you see them. And when I went back later, I'll we'll talk about it a little bit. This is one of the memorials in the city to the Jewish community. It was a stale and grave sandstone which had been placed on the site of the old synagogue which had been destroyed. It was a sandstone bit which when it, when it was defaced by some neo-Nazis could not be cleaned up completely so that you have all kinds of marking on it. And they moved into an old cloister where they thought it would be safe if they were still standing. In here, this is a picture of the new and very large Holocaust Memorial in Berlin. There are 2,100 plus of these stone boxes, all laid out symmetrically, random sizes, on the most expensive piece of real estate in Berlin, right around the bend from the Brandenburg Gate that memorial, the next one. And this is a shot in between. These are all in straight lines. And as people move between these rocks, you lose sight of them. Here one second, and they're gone. And this is one of the things I think that they're trying to get across. This random losing people. That's where the American Embassy is going up. It is facing the Holocaust Memorial. I don't know how many millions we are spending on that particular building, but 
but the State Department always does us proud with the buildings that they built. <laughs> this is underway, and for some reason, right across the street from the Holocaust Memorial, where they meant, you know, I don't know what they thought was behind that, but it was there. The thing that impressed me, and I'm not quite sure why or what it meant, is that I have gone over to place memorial tablets of the old Jewish cemetery for my parents, next one, and uh, which have been retained. And I found that throughout Germany, at the cities where I, that I was familiar with, there were memorials to Jews, and I found memorials that pertain very specifically to me. This is a picture of the Hotel Kempinski in Berlin. Five-star hotel, one of the oldest ones, which hardly, you know, it, it served President Kennedy. Every big shot ever goes to Berlin, goes to Kempinski. There's a plaque at the entrance commemorating the founder, Bertolt Kempinski, who was my, my great uncle. And it's still there. Take the next one. My time's going to be OK. This is a picture of the house that I grew up in. The yellow building. The family store was on the first two stories. Those two stories now house an H&M store. <laughs> Are you familiar with that one? We lived on the third floor. This is the shot of the city of the point. The other memorials that are seen all over, they tell me that 8,500 have been placed throughout Europe are called Stelpersteine, trip stones. Those are four by four brass plaques in the sidewalk. And here's a, the artist who has made these is placing them in front of our the old family home. Show the next one if you want. And these are the two plaques out in the sidewalk. Here lived Fritz Cohn, that was my father, and Bill Cohn, my mother. He fought in 1943, murdered in Auschwitz. And this is being done throughout the country in different places. The other thing that I noticed, you remember that church that I showed you in the beginning? On the door of that church was this flyer. It advertises a memorial day for the Jewish community on the anniversary of Crystal Light. On November the 10th, they were planning all day a memorial for what had been the Jewish community. This was on the inside of the church. It kind of was a mind blow when you see these things. And uh, yet I'm still struck, you know, are they protesting too much? Do they mean it? Are they with it? And what does all this memorializing mean? Something for you to think about. Thank you.
The other thing that we have in common, of course, is that we both grew up in Germany and survived children's books like that and still became honest and honorable citizens, in spite of everything. So don't give up hope. Well, we, when we talk about Kinder transport, and I'm going to primarily talk about that because it differentiates our experience from that of other survivors who were fortunate enough to, uh, to uh, survive that, uh, that event in history. Uh, Kinder transport is an event that concerned 10,000 Jewish children, and it's important to realize that on a personal level, it really consists of a thousand different stories. First of all, it concerns individuals. No two of them are alike. People, yes, even kids differ in their reaction to events which are thrust upon them. These children span different age groups, from 2 to 16. And surely their experiences were not the same. They came from different family backgrounds and the experience of separation from their parents would surely not affect each child in the same way. And also, probably most importantly, the way each child was accommodated in England differed widely. Some were taken into families as mothers helpers, like uh, uh, Hilda told us, uh, others were adopted as uh, foster children by their host family on the same, and treated on the, on the same level as their own children, and some others were still, still others were taken into private homes as foster children against payment which was given by some of the relief agencies. So you see, my story may be very different from that of many other <coughs> alumni of the children transport that you may run into. First of all, I was on the very first kinder transport, which arrived in England on December 2nd, 1938 barely three weeks after Kristalna, which gave the impetus to the entire rescue operation. Now, as a footnote to history, it's interesting to note that it took three weeks to introduce a bill in common, debate it, pass it into law, and build the infrastructure necessary on both sides of the channel for the first kinder transport to arrive in England. Now compare that with the way we pass laws today. <laughs> it all started with Crystal Night, the Crystal Night, the night of broken glass. I was 16 years old, and I was arrested by the Gestapo for the simple reason that they were looking for my father and he was not home, so they took me instead. The next man, the next day, when all men were taken, to, and every Jewish man in our city uh, was rounded up, and at that time, before rapid communication systems were in place, uh, the story differed somewhat from city to city. So I can only talk about what happened in our city, which was the city of Breslau, uh, in uh, eastern, uh, uh, in eastern Germany, Silesia, the capital of Silesia, about the size of San Francisco, 600,000. Uh, so all Jewish men were arrested and uh, were sent to Buchenwald. I absented myself uh, on the way to the train station and thus became a a law, I mean, a refugee, a refugee. I, I, uh, I escaped from the Gestapo and I had to get out of the country and that is a comp 
completely different story, but it does not primarily uh, have to do with the kinder transport. Uh, but uh, my grandmother, uh, who lived in Berlin, was active in the Jewish Women's League, and they were uh, given the task to uh, accumulate uh, names of kids that they could send to England. The Quakers worked uh, in England on this, and so she was able to get my name on the collector's passport, which listed all the names, because the passports were issued by the police station. The police were looking for me, so I couldn't ask for a passport. So my name was put on that collector's passport, which was then stamped after the names were all listed, or before the names were all listed, and uh, approved by the Gestapo. So I was able to uh, leave Germany, Yes, we too took the train through Holland, but we, this was the first kinder transport, and the nice Dutch ladies hadn't been alerted yet. So, <laughs> but, any of them but, but I'll get to hot chocolate yet. Uh, <coughs> German authorities, again, uh, uh, it's very rather uniform, in the, uh, non uniform in the way they treated us when we crossed the borders. Some of them were very matter of fact. Others took fun by turning the kids' suitcases upside down and let the kids put, put their stuff back in. So, but uh, the one thing I remember is that when we crossed the, the border into Holland, there was a huge sigh of relief. And uh, I guess the little kids caught it from the big, big kids and everybody was happy and singing. I remember crossing the English Channel. I wasn't seasick, but I remember that the fellow in the bunk below me was violently seasick. And he was always yelling, I'm puking my gallbladder out. He didn't know what a gallbladder was, but it was probably a term in his grandmother's vocabulary. So we, we arrived in Harwich and, and we were taken by bus to Dover Court Bay Holiday Camp. Holiday Camp was closed, it was December now, it's the second of December. Holiday Camp was closed for the winter, so it was just a wonderful site for to accommodate uh, masses of children who all of a sudden came on very short notice. There are really only three things that I distinctly remember of Dover Court Bay. One is that the roses were in bloom. Well, growing up in eastern Germany, we never saw roses in bloom in December. So that I remember. The second I remember is that gigantic bread buttering machine. They took a two-foot-long loaf of bread and put it in there, and they, they rolled us butter at the end of that loaf and cut off the slice and buttered and cut and cut and cut. And I didn't know that 30 years later I would design monstrosities like that myself. <laughs> and the, the third indelible impression was created by, by a bunch of local boys who wanted to impress the newcomers, the, the, the foreigners, by smoking two cigarettes at a time. <laughs> and I, I, that so astonished me. That actually, my wife is right now trans, transcribing all our correspondence from those days, and I wrote about that. That while we had to sneak a cigarette once in a while on Saturday night, here they can smoke openly and two cigarettes at a time. <laughs> no but now we know a lot more about smoking. <laughs> <laughs> but there were thousands of kids in Dover and every Sunday morning, cars would drive up from all over the country, and people would get out, and it really was very discouraging, because they looked over the kids, and hey, this guy looks nice, I like him, but what about the kids? Don't all kids look all that nice, you know? We were, 
told to flash up nicely and, you know, take two showers, but, but uh, it didn't help. Uh, so I don't know exactly. I mean, they all got selected somehow and sometimes. I myself, uh, there was a town in, uh, in a town in the south of England, uh, Bournemouth, uh, it's a resort town, has a Jewish community, but they formed the Bournemouth uh, Refugee Committee, uh, not a, maybe 20% Jewish, I mean the whole community got together, founded the, the Bournemouth Refugee Committee, and they, for the very purpose of establishing and sustaining a hostel for 20 Jewish boys, and they took 20 boys out of Tobacco's Bay and took them to Bournemouth, where they sent them to school, and uh, I don't, and, yeah, I took care of them as long as I was able to keep track of them. Uh, and only much later did we did I find out after the war that they also had a camp for 20 Jewish girls, but they never told us about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I worked in a garage because I had to learn the language, and. Uh, uh, and I was past compulsory school age. And I remember that I learned how to grind valves and rebuild worn spark plugs. Uh, I remember that I was taught never to wash a tea mug. It'll spoil the taste of tea forever. You always use it over again. You don't ever wash it between use. And the third thing I learned is how to appreciate French photography as evidenced by the little picture book the men in the shop brought over to show. And we're very proud to show the young, inexperienced friends. Uh, well, I, that didn't take very long, and I uh, found some, uh, I, I, I rest of my stay in England, I tried to work on a more promising career uh, and uh, got into the hotel business because the hotel business was the only business a foreigner could get into without a working permit because they attracted a lot of foreigners, they were a lot of foreign uh, visitors, so I got into the hotel business, I worked my way up from being a night porter, a dishwasher, to finally becoming a great dining room waiter. Of course, around that time I was greatly worried about my parents and my brother because the war clouds uh, gathered and I also was afraid that my somewhat uh, unorthodox departure from Germany would put them into special danger. So I learned that there was a law in England that anybody who was on a waiting list for immigration to America could get a temporary residence permit provided you found somebody to pay for your upkeep. So uh, I met a lady who was a headmistress of a boarding school and she gave me a guarantee for my brother. See, I have a little little brother who's going to be 80 next year, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, at that time <laughs> he was barely uh, 16 and uh, one, 10, 10, 12. Uh, and uh, so he had to be accommodated. I knew that my parents and my brother, they wouldn't split up. I either got all three of them out or none of them would come out. So I got, uh, got this uh, guarantee for my brother's stay. And uh, it's really quite interesting because I just read a book, a novel, an English novel, just finished it just last week, uh, where they, at an English school, it's fiction, but it's, of course, every, everybody who writes fiction writes from experience, uh, where it's an, it happens to take place at an English school just at that time, and all these letters arrive from Germany from parents trying to find scholarships for their, for their children, and they, of course, couldn't pay for this. Okay. Um, then I found, then I met a fellow by Mr. Jackson from Manchester who had a cotton mill, and he came to our hospital because he 
he and his partner had agreed to pay for the upkeep of the father of one of our co-hostelers. And when he heard that this target of his charity already was able to get out of Germany, uh, he said, well then, we have made up our mind to rescue one person, and I don't know to the present day how I was chosen by my father, and I was to get a guarantee from my father from him. So I got a guarantee from, from my father, and I had to get a guarantee from my mother, and I really tried so hard. And uh, on our refugee committee was a lady by the name of Miss West, and she was the mayor of a village about uh, 10 miles from where we lived, and she talked about my problem at the next meeting of the village council. And there were 20 villagers who each pledged one shilling, and it takes 20, took at that time 20 shillings to make a pound, and the Miss West was able to uh, to execute a guarantee for my mother in the name of all the villagers in North Castle. And in June 39, I was able to welcome my parents and my brother in Southampton. Uh, there's a lot more that I talk to talk about, and uh, because. The generosity, there, there, there are a number of examples of, of the generosity and the openness with, with which we were received in England. And I just want to tell you that when, we talk, when I talk about the Skinner Transport experience, um, two classes, uh, school classes here in this country, and uh, I was not fortunate enough to talk to a German-speaking school class. It would be a different experience altogether again. And then, of course, we talked to university classes. Uh, but uh, I want to summarize some of the teachings that we get from this, because an experience that doesn't teach us anything is personal. I mean, it's just uh, it's good for ourselves, but not for not beyond that. So first of and foremost is the unselfish hospitality which the people show to a bunch of strangers needing refuge. Whether the committee which financed our hostel or, or other people who privately showed their their generosity. Uh, it is really the individual, individual attitude of those people who made it possible for me to uh, rescue my parents. And this, when, when oh, probably 15 years ago, uh, the uh, aid shelter in Santa Rosa lost its state uh, subsidy. I went with that story to our congregation and said, look, if I can get people who give us a dollar a week, and we have 50 people who give us, I don't remember the figures now, but we use this particular model to keep the aid shelter open. So this is a lesson that not only was remembered in words, but also in deeds. The other lesson is, and you have a little bit too young for that because you're not bringing up kids yet, but you can impart that lesson on your parents. And that is, don't be overprotective and trust your kids. Only by being able to cope on their own will they learn the lessons of life. After all, I was 16 when I had to leave the house of my parents, and I managed to keep out of trouble, out of bad company, and survived and stayed out of jail in spite of being deprived of parental supervision. And I always felt that I should have the same confidence in my kids, that they were able to do, you know, that. Also, 
to keep the faith and not lose hope even when confronted with, uh, with adversity. Prepare the most devastating event of my life, my arrest by the Gestapo, may well have been responsible for the survival of myself and our entire family, for it forced me to flee, it got, it got me to England and made it possible for me to rescue my family. And finally, we all learn that if you catch a disease in its early stages, a treatment will be far simpler and more successful. The same holds true for the erosion of our liberty and the li liberties of minority groups and the deprivation of their freedom. Watch for the early symptoms and treat the disease while you still have time. If you wait too long, you will likely witness the gradual demise of our freedoms, and after a while, it may be too late for a meaningful and effective action. We do not want to witness the death of our democracy. Yes. In the areas you were transported to, either in England or in France, was there still a strong atmosphere of anti Semitism? The question was wherever it was that you were 
transporter to was there still a strong or was there a strong uh, level of anti-Semitism? Let's bet for us. It was hard to tell. The, uh, keep in mind that we were kind of segregated from the general population. In France, we had some very strong anti-Semitism in some parts of the country, not in others. In the central part, where we eventually evacuated, uh, the rural and farm families who became extremely protective of the other kids. Now, at the point where we removed Eric, 200 kids left, a couple thousand were left in other places at that one who never made it out. Some of them were hidden by the French. Most of them, of course, wound up in the But uh, it was a random kind of thing. You know, uh, the, the feeling coming as to who will protect and who will not. <coughs> And they were listening to me, and this is 
subject of this extremely time. This is a measure with a rather taciturn man and a task master. But that just went with a tariff one. And it was a little dumb by the taken plate of land. You also have to realize the great age difference. In other words, a kid that would be taken into the family at age two or three, you know, would really remember very little of the natural uh, environment that, you know, the natural parents. And uh, so it, it's probably very, very different for the older children. But I, I know that from, from some of the people that I met that some had really very good relationships and made great friendships with the natural children, you know, the, the, the offspring of the host parents. strange kind of things. I've been there once before there was a newspaper story about my coming. This guy saw it, called the paper and asked how he could get in touch with me. And then they arranged to have us meet when I went back. And at that meeting, they had a TV reporter and a newspaper reporter sitting in on And it was amazing the way this went. My German was not very good, and his English was worse than my German. <laughs> but he managed to communicate quite well. But what was interesting is that the reporters who were late 20s, I would guess, really gave this man a very, very bad time. What did you know? When did you know? It? Why didn't you do something? And I kept on saying, he was only 10. <laughs> he was only 10. We were all victims. And I think that's a pervasive kind of thing. There's a generational gap in here. And uh, if we're, we've run up against the clock. Okay, one more question and we've run up against the clock. I was yes. just going to ask, why did the Nazis allow this? Why did the, why Nazis, did the Nazis allow, allow the children to transport to even happen? Well, they were only too happy to get people out of the way so they wouldn't have to deal with that later. You have to realize that was before what they call now the final solution, before death camps were really in operation. At that time, it was the goal of the German government to make Germany, like you said, Judenland, uh, get rid of the Jews. The, the, the killing machines were not in operation at that time. That was a year later, two years later. Uh, won't you join me in thanking our guests?